I wake up to birdsong outside my window. The sunlight filtering through my blinds makes me wince and turn away. A fragrant, unfamiliar smell lingers. I open my eyes. The desire to find the origin of said smell increases. Dressed in my pajamas, I watch myself yawn in my bedroom mirror. I observe the woman in front of me and tilt my head. At some point, I became her. I don't remember when. I pull my cheeks and make faces. I'm a bit out of it. Half of my consciousness is struck in, stuck in dreamland. I examine myself closer. Around my eyes, slight wrinkles have started to form. Aging. A natural process. I try to contain my panic as I ruffle my hair, trying to erase that train of thought. I stride towards the kitchen. Morning. Like a cheesy Hollywood flick, the kitchen table is covered in marvelous breakfast spread. The mess has been replaced by food. Plates and containers of different shapes, sizes, smells, and colors decorate my table. When? Did I have time for this? He cuts me off. You're a pretty deep sleeper. I'm shocked that no one's robbed you yet. I spot quite a few items that I'm sure I didn't purchase yesterday. Everything from Dijon mustard to avocados to hummus. You must have gone to the store. I can't remember the last time someone cooked for me. It took me all morning. You better enjoy. Consider it a small token of appreciation for letting me stay with you. I smile and have to turn away to wipe a few stray tears before he sees them. We sit down and enjoy the feast. Later that day, I am in constant amazement. I walk around my seemingly spotless house, free from the filth of my laziness. No thanks to my hard work. Sophie, you lazy bitch. Charles has left for his classes, so the empty room receives my words. I nervously pull up my phone. I check my feeds. I am instantly reminded of why I shouldn't. Past, present, and then future. Separate things. Leave the past in the past, won't you? Obsessing over past accomplishments doesn't make you less pathetic in the present. Can't you see that? Charles is at school. In the meantime, I do nothing. How pathetic. The last few years, this time of year was often the most busy for us. The massive contrast is hard to fathom. I pull out a small, worn-out book and pencil from my pocket. I jot down a few sentences. I have so much time, I don't know what to do with it. Charles doesn't, so he doesn't even notice how little I do in a day. I wonder if he'd think less of me. My thoughts end there. I need a new hobby. Something productive. Something creative. When did I last feel a sense of accomplishment from something I made myself? A long time ago. No doubt about that. High school. That made closer to 15 years than 10. Time to get out of here. I can't stand being in this house any longer. I grabbed a quick shower and kicked myself in makeup, desperate to erase any sign of aging. Then I spent too much time in front of the mirror. Well, who cares? Not like it hurts anyone or anything, except my ego. One day I'll realize that I've grown old. I grab my coat and head out into the cold. Within a minute, my cheeks are numb. It's not windy, but my breath seems to freeze in my throat when I slow my pace. I move forward, my boots crunching satisfyingly in the snow with each firm step. I'm moving forward. Where am I heading? I sometimes come here, past a nearby residential area, only a fifteen-minute walk from where I live. It's calm, quiet, and often not very busy. Never with a purpose, though. But I've always asked, end up asking myself, what makes them tick? There's an old man feeding birds, a couple on a bench, and a child chasing powdery snowflakes. Different people each time. They must have something in common. What do they see that I don't? It's so pretty. Sure is. Hey, did you bring the hot chocolate? Oh, one second. The couple start to prepare two steaming cups of dark hot chocolate. I get jealous. I look away. Next, my eyes are drawn to the old man. There you go. There you go. Eat it all up. May you last the winter, my lovelies. The birds walk around in the snow, picking up the seeds of the man scattered on the ground. I get sentimental. I look away. My eyes dart around the place. Next, they lock onto the child playing in the snow. 
Mommy, why can't I grab them? They always escape. The mother chuckles. When the flakes reach your palm, they melt. Look at your hand next time. You'll see. So, I killed them? I killed the snowflakes? Roar. That's not it. You just turned them into something else. I get maternal. I look away. I ponder the reasons as to why they live the way they do. No answers. I would ask them, but I... What kind of crazy one would even consider asking strangers such an intimate question? As if in response a voice for sounds from within my head. They can't help you anyway. Not without knowing at all. And even then, their frames of references are nothing like yours. Their advice would be lost on you. So it's useless. Useless. I get back on my feet and leave. Down the main street I go, like so many times before. Step after step after step. Bustling crowds. Cool wind running past my ears. Christmas is coming up. You can tell as much by the frantic shopping. The streets are busier than ever. Christmas music plays from every store I pass by. As a child, Christmas was a time of miracles. Festive atmosphere, food, and company. Presents, the unknown, happy surprises. It was a time to expect the unexpected, but always with happy results. That's why it was a time of love and comfort. A holiday constructed for happiness. And as we grew older, it lost part of its charm. And for me, entirely so. Absorbing the Christmas spirit on the streets, memories rushed to my head. My memories. They're of the bad kind. One Christmas in particular stands out to me. A particularly bad one, too. I wouldn't be able to forget it, ever. No matter how hard I'd try. It was anything but charming. It was anything but nostalgic. In fact, there was nothing pleasant about the memory. My thoughts being where they are, I can't help thinking back on it. Second by second, frame by frame. Life being lost in a terrifying sequence of images. Christmas Eve, 2010. Sophie, what are dreams made out of? The girl's pupils are the size of small pinheads. She's staring straight at me with a deranged look. Bloodshot eyes, needle mark veins, a strong animalistic smell filling the tour bus. I'm far from sober myself. I had none of the stuff this girl's body is currently trying to cleanse her of. Occasionally she bends over. She lets her body lets out stomach acid and rejection. Then she looks up at me. This matter minutes pass. I hold her head and stroke her back. The cycle repeats itself. Christmas Eve. A magical day full of joy. Dreams, you say. We're beyond dreams. You, me, and us, we're all beyond dreams. We reached high, grabbed hold, but kept reaching into the abyss. What do you say? Aren't you happy? My tone is full of scorn. She looks at me, gaze wavering. Sinful tears of vanity caused mascara to run down her face. I'm so happy. I'm so happy I could die. Her pupils roll back into her head. You fucking idiot. I firmly grip her head with one hand and pinch her upper arm with the other. Stay with me. I shake her lightly as I keep saying pain throughout her body. Her eyes appear from the back of her head. Try to stay away for a while longer. This matter. Then it ended. And then Christmas Eve of 2010 ended. I didn't want to know how to hollow out life, but there I was. Hollow amongst hollow people living a hollow lifestyle. Once you hollow out an object, it's hard to refill it with a substance of the original quality. I wasn't paying the price for it back then, but I am paying for it now. So how do you recover from going to the moon and back? The highest point of Mount Everest to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Reaching absolute euphoria to feeling void.
Someone taps my right shoulder firmly, pulling me straight out of the depths of my mind. Hey, yeah. He nods at me with a usual charming smile. Already out of class? Yeah, teacher had to go pick up a sick kid or something. Oh. Have you had lunch yet? Lunch? I haven't even had breakfast yet, but that's another sign of how painfully incompetent I am. So I don't even want to put it into words. I was far too busy getting mesmerized by the scene over the lake. I haven't. Great, let's go. He grabs my wrist and starts leading me away. Well, okay. One of the perks of living in a compact city like ours is that there's never a great restaurant too far off. I get the feeling that you could eat at a different shop every day and not run out of them for quite a while. A brisk 15-minute walk later, we arrived at the place. We even took a few detours at my request. Once inside the bustling restaurant, we sit down and I observe Charles as he flips through the lunch menu. Orders being shouted out loud, customers talking loudly, waiters bringing and taking away plates. Charles, however, looks so calm and uncaring, despite everything going on around him. I wonder how he does it. I, on the other hand, hold a cup of black coffee in my hands and stare in the direction of any sudden noise. Did your parents teach you not to stare? His gaze moves to me as he chuckles. What? Well, yes. I'm not staring, though. I'm observing. You... how do you do it? Do what? Turn off your brain. Mute the surroundings. He exhales deeply. White noise, isn't it? Have you finished the concise ex explanation? He returns to the menu. This looks good. I look down to where he's pointing. I do not know how to pronounce that. Bulgogi dapap. Thinly sliced marinated beef with onions on top of a fluffy pile of rice. My first thought was that I'm really not too hungry after all. The memories I recall earlier left an odd lingering sensation of nausea in my stomach. The second. Wait, what is this place? My eyes start around the place. They lock onto the restaurant's logo. A Korean restaurant. Hey, did you pick this place on purpose? You do know I'm part Korean, right? I'd been far too busy being me to notice the kind of restaurant we're in. Not only that, I'd been looking at the menu. But however, I didn't actually read it. I put my fist against my forehead for a brief moment in grief. Who knows? Honestly, I wasn't sure if your mom was Japanese, Korean, or Chinese. Does that offend you? Oh, he's actually met my mother. I had completely forgotten that. My mother. A strong pang of guilt and regret hits me, like a blow to my stomach. No, my heart. I feel as if a bucket of mixed emotion has been dumped over me. Charles tilts his head at me. I smile. It's the kind everyone knows as a mask. Charles is no exception to this rule. Is your mother alright? Oh, I'm sure she's fine. A lie. I stare into my coffee. Those words are enough to disenchant me. Memories fill my head to the brim. My mind is absorbed by the coffee into a world of black. The truth is, I was a self-absorbed, non-empathetic teenager. The worst kind of human teenager daughter. A scene from my life around the year of 2006. See you. With these nonchalant words, I turned around and left my soul paired at the doorstep by herself. I love you. I didn't return those words despite her having brought me into this world. When I think about the kind of person I used to be, I feel disgusted with myself. I know I'm different now. I know it perfectly well. Still, these memories are enough to make me stagger with shame. I went on to travel with my friends. Not once did I think back on my mother. My only mother. My only parent. I met new people. I experienced new things. Simply put, I lived life. But I was not grateful. Not for one moment. On the contrary, I expected life to show me gratitude. I was full of myself. I was expected to be. Such was the life I used to live. What came after changed me. Actually, no. At that point, I had already changed. I realized too late. I can't think about this any longer. Why, you ask? Because I'm being filled with the familiar sensation of unredeemable regret. I snap out of it. I need to stop beating myself up, don't I? But 
it's not as easy as it seems. I can no longer make up for my past disgusting behavior. Not to the one who deserves it most. You alright? He looks at me with a worried expression. I'm fine. I'll have the bulgogi too. Alright. The food doesn't take long to arrive. Learn anything useful today? Sure. But it's going to take me a while to get into it. Flipping through textbooks isn't for me. I prefer hands-on learning. What are you studying again? Composition. Right. Guitar, was it? Well, I like most instruments, but that's how I started out, yeah. Do you remember the tiny red acoustic guitar you used to have? He chuckles briefly. Now that you mention it, yes. Didn't you used to bring that everywhere? Yeah, I suppose I did. God, you were annoying. That's what my grumpy neighbor said as he snapped it in two. Oh no. I mean, it was incredibly annoying, still, there was something special about it. Well, that's the truth. It's harsh, but objects can be broken. My will to annoy others with music, however, cannot. I've gotten pretty good. You better believe it. I'm sure. I give him a bittersweet smile. Damn, that was a good meal. He stretches vigorously, contentedly sighing. I'm not even halfway through my bowl. His abrupt change of topic jolts me out of my train of thought. Take your time. Thanks. The umami heavy beef combines with the light fluffy rice to create a paradise in my mouth. So, for umami, I always describe, like, when this term comes up, I always think savory. That's probably the best way to describe it. The word annoys me, in case you're wondering. The burning memories and their physical embodiments have left me, at least for the moment. Soon, I'm picking out single grains of rice from the bottom of my bowl. It's been a while since I enjoyed a nice meal out, in public, with another person. Perhaps the outside isn't so scary after all. In the afterglow of an amazing meal. Out of nowhere, I accidentally let out a small burp. I instinctively cover my mouth in embarrassment. Charles quickly catches on. It was that good, huh? Shut up. Where to next? Before I utter another word, he goes on. Oh, I know just the place. I do too. It's called home. Fuck's sake, Sophie, it's only afternoon. You're still young. No excuses. I groan. How about you stop bringing up my age all the time? Did you say something? If not, let's go. We promptly leave the restaurant. Once again, we enter the main street. I turn right and Charles turns left. From behind me, I hear his lament. You stubborn woman. He walks up behind me, firmly grabs my hand, and gently pulls me in his direction. Fine. So what did you have in mind? You'll see. We walk through the crowds for a good while, taking in the atmosphere of a busy shopping street. The smells of food, perfume, and smoke all linger in the air around us. The vapors create spiraling clouds in the cold winter air. They float towards the sky from food stalls and smokers alike. Charles stops in front of me. My stomach turns into a knot when I realize where he has brought me. There aren't many left, but I thought it would be a cool place to check out before they're completely gone. I hesitantly step into the music store. I hope I won't regret this. Row after row of CDs, DVDs, vinyl records, and plastic containers. Store is cramped. Alongside the walls, sampling stations have been installed. Hi-fi headphones and amplifiers, EQ knobs and switches, tons of them. All available surfaces are covered in posters, discs, and advertisements. This place smells earthy. The atmosphere is quite gloomy, much like you'd expect from a store dealing in old merchandise. Charles is already flipping through the vinyl records, one by one, front to the very back of each crate. This is cool. He shows me a record by an artist unknown to me. He's quite he's a quite impressive guitar player. Deceased now. I feel like his music never got the attention it deserved. I see. Then there's me. Alive, undeserved, and nothing of true value to show for it. Come here, listen. Charles 
Jones moves to a sample booth. He's urging me to come over. I ruffle my hair a bit, tucking it behind my ears. Here you go. And, uh, these are some of my favorite headphones. They go great with this amp and DAC, too. These people have amazing taste. The store clerk wants to overheard him as Charles shares a moment of eye contact and grins with him. Now that I'd ever be able to afford this setup, this stuff costs a fortune. He hands them to me, and I place the huge headphones over my ears. Well, let's hear your promised magic, Charles. The outside world fades. The speakers cover my ears as if they were lids. Music starts to play. Gently plucked guitar strings create a peaceful melody. Its complexity and masterful delivery instantly makes my hair stand on end. I drown in the slow hypnotic song, isolated from the rest of the world. I start humming, unable to hear anything but the artist's intent. After a short moment of dreaming off, the track ends. I want to hit the replay button and have the song put me in another dimension once again, but I don't. I push aside my inner conflict and remove the bulky headphones. Charles looks at me with excitement. It was good, wasn't it? Yeah, very impressive, actually. I'm glad you liked it. He's one of my major sources of inspiration. It's different from the top 100 mainstream garbage, right? Yeah. And what's with the skilled humming, dude? I couldn't exactly tell which parts you were listening to. I sing sometimes. That's cool. He looks at the posters on display. Most of these bands are really great. I'm glad we came here. Oh, they even have a section for popular stuff. Gotta sell them to stay open, I guess. He scoffs and then turns towards me. Aren't you just sick of the unoriginal beats and identical song structures? The worst part is the fake facade, though, and the performers overacting. They just make me sick, you know. Yeah, I do know. I nod. His eyes look on lock onto a, one particular poster. So do mine. My heart almost ceases beating. He stares at the poster with a puzzled expression. His back is turned away from me. He starts to mumble. You know, this girl looks an awful lot like you. He walks closer. Mumbles. Then he turns around. His expression is blank. My expression is blank. Then his face goes through a range of different emotions. He's putting the puzzle together. You're kidding. You're kidding! He still has to decide how to react. I sense frustration, anger, surprise, and joy in his voice. His intense scrutiny reminds me of an extraordinarily anxious day of mine. My mind turns into a white mist. I'm brought back to a time when things were vastly different. Twenty twelve spring. The day is cloudy. I'm under a damp tent, in between two perfume wearing radio hosts. Their handheld microphones are on either side. They look straight at me. A low metal fence surrounds the impromptu radio booth. A myriad of fans stand in a circle around us, ready with their cameras and phones. Today we're joined by Miss Julia of... I feel everyone's eyes. They're stuck to me like glue. I feel dirty, vulnerable, and exposed. I'd rather not be here, but there's no room for protests. If I mess up, my mates will hate me. I just have to get it over with. No excuses. That's right, Miss Julia. Welcome. Thank you. The recent comeback is everyone's attention right now. Everyone's attention? Everyone's attention. After that, I don't remember much. What I do remember is everyone scrutinizing my every word, my every gesture, my every noise. And we'll see you all next time. Peace! I instantly put down my microphone and rise from my seat. I look around nervously. What is the easiest way out of here? I take off towards the tour bus. I walk past the fences with a fake smile. In every direction, my fans reach for me. Sophie, look here! Smile for us! So pretty! 
Small hands, large hands, young hands, old hands, hairy hands, smooth hands, gross hands, pretty hands. I shudder while keeping up appearances. I snap back to reality. Yeah, just shut up about it, will you? Whoa. Charles looks shocked. After a few moments of silence, I realize that my words were both rude and aggressive. I come to my senses. Sorry, that was rude. He looks at me in silence, clearly confused over my sudden outburst. That's okay. So, you're actually that girl? He nods at the poster. Not anymore. Thankfully. He's still staring at me, now with huge eyes. It's not as interesting as you think. Stop looking at me like that. Also, we're going. I start walking towards the exit with Charles following closely behind. Of course it is. Why didn't you tell me about it? It's difficult for me to talk about. I wasn't sure how to break it to you. I was hoping it'd sort itself out, on some level. And here we are. Besides, I liked having someone who didn't know. It's pretty cool. I sigh and look away. I walk faster. Feel free to think so, but keep it to yourself. I always knew you'd be great. Red flashes before my eyes. I told you not to say such things. There's nothing great or impressive about that life. Nothing good about it at all, got it? Once again, Charles looks visibly shocked. I can feel the clerk's eyes on me. I'm going home. I rush out of the music store, leaving Charles behind. I walk through the crowds, pushing myself through the masses. My head pounds with rage. The crowded streets are much like you'd expect from Friday before the holidays, and they're in my way. What an idiot, saying that to my face. He doesn't know what I've been through. He doesn't know what I've been through. The words ring in my head. I realize my mistake. I'm the idiot. Blinded by rage. Don't push away your only friend, idiot. You'll pay the price. So don't. You need him more than you think. If it weren't for him, you'd be all alone. You don't want that. I know that much. So stop being an ass. Talk to him instead of snapping at him. His reaction was perfectly normal. You're being oversensitive. The average person will be interested. They don't know what I went through, though. What we went through. Most will never know what it's like. I'm in front of my door. Instead of opening it, I put my hands on it. Shortly followed by my forehead. Warm meets cold. Idiot. Later in the afternoon, Charles returns. I'm at the kitchen counter, my back faces him. It's easier this way. I know he's going to address my outburst. It's lingering in the air. I'm sorry about before. I do realize it's a sensitive subject for you, but I'd still like to know more. You spend the majority of your adult life doing it, right? I let out a troubled sigh. It is, and I have. Take your time, though. Tell me what you want, when you want, okay? Okay. I went to bed that night, reminiscing about good and bad times. About the overjoyed eleven-year-old getting to hug me. About the distant relatives trying to get a piece of the cake. Calling it all a miserable journey would have been a lie. But there's more bad than good. The best was... The worst was... I can't sleep. It's late. But I can't stay here any longer. The ant-like sensation under my skin says so. I get out of bed. I'll take a walk. I sneak out of the house, grasping my coat firmly. I turn the key. The lock clicks. The absurd cold is the first thing to strike me. I tremble. 
My insides feel as if they're being tickled by icy fingers. I pick up the pace. It's quiet and serene. In my town, night often is. All I hear is my breath and the cracking noise of boots against snow. Air becomes smoke. I enter the main street. As expected, it's busier than my residential area. The storefronts are mostly dark. Along the street, a few windows glow. Bars, restaurants, 24-7 stores. I wander. The wind whines just a tiny bit. My hands are cold. I put them in my coat pockets. I walk until I see a storefront that appeals to me. I didn't know they were open this late nowadays. I walk inside. The bell rings as usual. The steam room has turned into a bar. Aside from a drunken village man hunched over the bar, the seats are empty. Hello, dear. She sounds genuinely surprised. I can see the distinct look of worry in her eyes. Hello? Sophie, darling. This is the first time I've seen you at this hour. Something the matter. I knew it. Since the very beginning, she's known who I am. I'm a bit shocked at her familiarity. At the same time, it's nice to have someone care. I just had some trouble sleeping. Oh, you thought alcohol would solve that problem? No, in fact, I didn't even know you served it. I just walked past here and I... She smiles at me. Despite her age, her beauty shows. Her curly white hair is elegant, and her hazel eyes give off the image of total sobriety. There's a depth to them. The kind where you know they know. Her voice is colored by a contagious coldness. Ah, I know what it is. What makes her words seem so soft to my senses? The way she speaks. It's the way a mother would speak to her child. Come here, sweetheart. She leads me to my usual table and urges me to sit down. I'll bring you something nice. In the meantime, why don't you sit down and relax? She touches my shoulder briefly. She smiles before walking up behind the counter. I feel like I'm imposing in a sense. But then again, I always do, and at this hour, this place is empty. Maybe it's not that big a deal. She returns with a steaming cup of what looks like milk tea. I pull out my wallet. Oh no, I won't take your money. Not today. This one is on the house. In fact, we don't even serve these normally. This is only for you and only today. A limited offer, if you will. Go ahead, give it a try. I bring the hot drink to my lips. The rich flavor instantly fills my mouth. The sucking sensation spreads to my nose. It's milk tea. Something has been added. Cardamom? There's definitely a splash of alcohol, too. It's delicious. She puts her hands together in joy. I'm so glad. May I sit down for a moment? Sure. I take sips from the beverage. Then she sits down next to me and puts her hand on my arm. Feeling any better? I do. Great. I look at her. With her hand placed on my arm, I expected her to stare right at me, but her gaze is aimed at something far, far away. Winter always brings surprises, have you noticed? I look at her while trying to interpret her words. Well then, go on. This is no place for a fine young woman like you at this late at night. I look over at the barely conscious grunting man. I get up and put my coat back on. Whenever something's bothering you, you come pay me a visit. You're always welcome, okay? Okay, I will. Off you go. Thank you. Pay it no mind. It's midnight on a Sunday. People have work tomorrow. I'm not most people, though. Thus, I'm exempted. It's a blessing and a curse, lacking a purpose. The streets are nearly empty. I'm walking alone. My stomach feels warm, and the moonlight colors seem stronger than they should. I feel at peace.